So we're going to continue with our 10 plus 0 games, which I think is a nice kind of happy medium between Blitz and Rapid. So we're going to play one or two 10 plus 0 games. Welcome to those watching on YouTube. We continue to climb through the ranks. We're rated 829, still at the sort of beginner level, still most games decided in the opening. But we're starting to see, you know, signs of life from our opponents. And hopefully we'll get our first Glex system. We will not. We will still not get our first Glex system. So far, we faced Philidors. We faced, you know, Elephant Gambits. We can't seem to get uh, the four knights out of their opening square. So Bishop C5 is a sideline. And it's not a very good sideline, but not because it's conceptually bad. It's tactically flawed. Uh, this move is tactically flawed, and, you know, if you've spent enough time around E4, E5 openings, uh, you should already immediately begin to kind of sense why uh, this is a serious inaccuracy. And, of course, it's the center fork trick, which is knight takes E5. And I know that there's a lot going on in this specific position, so you might be familiar with this trick, but you might be like, well, what about bishop takes F2 check? What about queen H4? All of those moves are very easy to meet, uh, and I'll talk about them after the game. This is the classical execution of the center fork trick you temporarily sack a piece in the center and then you win the piece back by forking generally a bishop on c5 and a knight on e5 and why is it good for us because it well in this particular instance uh, our opponent uh, has been forced to part ways with their bishop now the knight on e5 is unstable the pawn on g7 is already under fire black is already in huge trouble and bishop takes d4 was a pretty serious mistake okay so, well, here we should pause for a second. The obvious move is f4. And this is the move that's probably on the tip of most people's tongues. But anytime you push a pawn like this, you have to be aware of the weaknesses that are created. And in, in response to f4, black has this very unpleasant check on h4, which maybe our opponent is not going to see, but I'm not going to rely on mistakes from our opponent. I'm going to play soundly. Now, why is queen h4 check annoying? Because we can't really go g3, because that allows the knight to sneak into f3 with a fork against our queen. And yeah, we could play f4, queen h4, check, queen f2, but do we really want to trade queens in a situation where we have a lead in development, we have the bishop pair, and we have a huge center? I would like to keep the queens on the board and try to play for maximum. So instead of f4, as tempting as it is, let's just develop some pieces. So let's focus on this dark squared bishop. Where can we bring it? We could bring it out to f4 in order to put pressure on the knight. On the other hand, if we play bishop f4, maybe we allow this move queen f6. So actually, black has a couple of annoying tactical ideas here that we have to sidestep. And I'm going to go bishop e3. I'm going to play this very, very solidly, Russian schoolboy mode. Just bring the bishop out to e3, support the queen. And remember, from an earlier game, we are not afraid of moves. And there we go. Queen f6, case in point. I think our opponent gets excited about the prospect of a discovered check. But now that the bishop is protecting the queen, we have nothing to worry about. And queen f6 is not only a waste of time, but potentially a fatal mistake. So what should you immediately be thinking about when you see a queen like this on f6? The piece that most commonly attacks a queen that's out prematurely is the knight. So knight d5 should be on the tip of your tongue. Knight to d5 is what we play. This is why we put the bishop on e3, by the way. Were our bishop on f4, black would have the counter strike knight f3 check winning our queen. So now the queen is forced to go all the way back to its initial square, but people don't like to do that at this level. So our opponent might stubbornly try to go knight f3 or collapse completely, but black is already borderline lost because one of the most important rules, just because a move doesn't work in one position, doesn't mean that you have to abandon it altogether. Very, very easy to forget about, right? Remember that move f4? Well, the circumstances have changed, and we need to check this move again, because if it works, it brings us tremendous dividends. We win the g7 pawn, potentially we win the whole game. So what was the problem with f4 earlier? Well, it was queen h4 check. But now we have a bishop on e3, and we can simply block that check with the bishop. And notice that in that situation, the knight is guarding the f4 pawn from behind. So clearly f4 is now uh, not only viable, but incredibly strong. c5, okay. That doesn't scare us. Well, preferably we would stay on the same diagonal. Can we do that? 
we can. We can drop back to c3. Maybe some of you wanted to go queen a4 check and thought that you were winning the knight. But no, black can block with the bishop. Queen a4 check in this case is an awkward move. Okay, knight g4. Fantastic. So is the coast clear? Can we take on g7? Yes, we can. There is no reason not to. And the game is essentially over. Now, if our opponent takes the bishop on e3, we'll have to do a little bit of calculation to figure out which piece we take in which order. You know, do we take the rook? Do we take the knight? We're going to have a very pleasant choice. But let's wait for our opponent's move. Now, this move, c5. Notice just how damaging it is. This knight on d5 is now a monster, but it's all a moot point. So we have forced checkmate here, and this is a good example of not rushing. Although, to be honest, queen takes h8, king to d7, and bishop to b5 is almost as good as the most accurate sequence of moves, which is to start with bishop b5 in order to take away this escape square from the king. And now you play queen takes h8. And by the way, this is a very important tactical theme. In this case, it's a super banal illustration because we're already so winning. But this idea of taking away the king's only retreating square before you proceed with the mating combination is kind of important. There's an Alakine game on this topic. Let's see if I can find it. Yes. There's a great Alakine, Alakine game on this exact topic. As our opponent is pondering... Okay, never mind. I'm going to set that position up. And we're going to start with that Alakine game. Now, some of you might have seen this game before. This is semi-famous. We can delete this for now. This is the game um, Alakine versus Mindeno. 1933, Simul in the Netherlands. So Alakine is white. So this is a classic situation. White has sacrificed a piece. And white has this massive attack down the age file. So a lot of newer players, they look at this position and they want to give this check. But as we've discussed previously, the king will run away, king f7. And maybe you're thinking, oh, can I sack the queen? No, that's, um, Alakine is white and drunk. Yeah, sadly, he was drunk a lot of the time. Uh, rook h7, king g6, this fizzles out into not even a draw. I think white loses in this line. So what is the, the key to this position? The key to this position is the king has only one escape route through f7. If we can cover that escape route up, then... We might create a situation where rook h8 is unstoppable. So how do we do that? Well, you might say, well, obviously the move is g6. But g6, I will play queen takes g6. And now you get some intrigue because you might say, ah, but now I can maybe slide over the queen. But then again, I can block with d5. And again, white is at a dead end. Because if you play knight e5 in this position, trying to threaten rook h8 mate, pause the video if you're watching on YouTube and see if you can understand what's wrong with this approach. What's wrong with this approach? Yeah, queen takes h5. Desperado. Sacrifice and black wins the game. And black wins the game. So move order is very important here. And Alakine comes up with an amazing combination. He understands that the safest way to prevent king f7 is to push g6. In order to push g6, he has to deflect black's queen from e6. But to deflect black's queen from e6 is not that easy. So queen c4 comes to mind. To some of you guys, a queen sacrifice. So queen c4, the problem is queen takes c4, g6, and you have to be very careful about these situations where you've sacrificed a ton of material because your opponent can give away almost all of it, but as long as they defend against the mate threat, you're in trouble. So black has the move queen f1 check, buying him themselves some time that they can then use, for example, to escape with the king through f8 and e7. This is actually a very advanced trick. So we've tried seemingly all of the move orders. There is only one move order that works. The correct move order is to play knight e5 on the first move. Knight e5. So temporarily covering the f7 square. Black is forced to play d takes e5. If queen takes e5, then you can simply trade queens and play g6. And mate is unstoppable. So black has to play d takes e5. Now again, queen c4 is what everybody says when they look at this position, but it's wrong for several reasons, one of which one of which is this queen f1 check resource. The correct move order is to start with g6. Incredible move. You're threatening me. There are no checks. Black has to take. And now you give the sideline check with the queen, and that's it. Black and block, but eventually black will have to put a piece on f7, and rook h8 is checkmate. So that's Alakine versus Mindeno. 
I would spend longer on this, but I, I want to keep the speed run going. So for those watching on YouTube, how does this tie into uh, the, the, the game? Of course, this was a much simpler situation in our game, but I think you can s understand the similarity. There's a lot of situations where, for example, you don't want to grab the material immediately or give the check immediately. First, you identify the escape route, and often you want to give this check or even a quiet move that blocks it, and only then, let's say, do you capture the rook with checkmate. That is the most clinical approach. Here, it doesn't really matter. So what can I say about this game? Not too much. I just want to talk a little bit about the opening. So I'm going to pull up uh, this game on chess base. I have the game open on chess base. Yeah, so once again, we face a sideline, bishop c5, and knight takes c5, which is just a move that you have to know uh, if you want to play the Glex system or the four knights. So queen f6 is not scary. Let's go through a couple of moves because you can just drop the knight back to f3 with an extra pawn. Knight f6, I think, transposes into the Stafford or some form of the Stafford gambit after knight c6, dc6. But it's a pretty bad form of the Stafford Gambit because black is not supposed to play knight f6. White can play the move h3, preventing these nasty knight g4 escapades. And queen to d4 is not scary because you can just bring the queen out to f3. All of this is illusory activity. It's illusory because once you play d3, you're already threatening to knock the queen back with bishop e3. Black can basically create a bunch of one-move threats, but they're very, very easy to parry. And eventually, you're going to get your pieces out and you're going to be up a, a center pawn, which is a disaster for black. Uh, so that's also not really dangerous. Queen to h4 is a move that some people are scared of. Here, you can actually just go g3. And again, black is sent back to f6. And you can go either knight to d3. Yeah, knight to d3 is simple. Bishop to b6, for example, and now knight to d5, forcing the queen back. So none of these moves are remotely scary. Now, bishop takes f2 check scares a lot of people who aren't too experienced with the center fork trick because they think, oh, black gives away the bishop and now the king is going to be weak forever. But that's not true. The king is not going to be weak forever. First of all, black has given away the bishop pair and complete central control. So we can just play d4 and we have these major assets. Third of all, once the bishop comes out, you can simply castle by hand or perform manual castling as it's called where you literally tuck your king manually back to g1. And actually, it's a kind of a good thing in the long run that black has taken f2 because you have the semi-open f file with which to operate when black castles kingside, which is likely. Now, are we scared of queen h4 check? Absolutely not. We can parry with g3. And this kind of stuff is the opposite of scary. It just loses the game. King g2, queen h5, bishop e2, and the knight is lost because h3 is coming. So there's no magic in chess. You can't checkmate an entire army with two pieces, which is why in this position after d4, black has to basically go knight g6. Now we develop the bishop. Um, I don't know. Let's say black plays d6. And already we are set to play rook f1. Whatever. Knight e7, king g1 with an amazing position. And you would never know that white didn't castle if you looked at this position. So oftentimes these bishop f2 moves are not scary. Okay, so our opponent takes d4, and bishop takes d4 is a subsequent inaccuracy. Already, black is in some trouble. What is black supposed to do in this type of situation? So if you've missed the center fork trick, what is the standard textbook reaction, uh, textbook best reaction considered to be? Most of the time, not always, most of the time. Yeah, most of the time, you're supposed to keep your bishop with bishop d6, and white is better because we have the development advantage in a good center, but black, of course, has a very playable position after knight f6. Playable position. Um, now, this is not a dogma. There are certain situations in which there are other ways to protect against the center fork trick. For instance, there's an opening called the Four Knights English, in which white plays this very modern setup e4. And one of the most topical lines in this variation continues bishop c5, White actually implements the center fork trick with knight takes e5. And after knight e5, d4, what's fascinating is that people who are not experienced in this position, even GMs, will often go bishop d6 automatically. But bishop d6 almost loses the game to a very unconventional move that is just not a thing in e4 openings. Does anybody know what it is? 
Why is bishop d6 wrong? And what is the correct move in this position for black? Yes, very good. People know it. It's c5. And white just avalanches black's pieces. Black's pieces are collapsing. Um, because either you give away the knight and this knight is going to get trapped. Or you have to give away the bishop and ruin your structure. So the correct move is actually bishop to b4. d5 and knight takes e4. And now the line goes on. This is a very sharp line. You can investigate it on your own. So don't blindly apply these rules, but in e4 openings, most of the time you want to go bishop b6. Okay, so final thing I'll say here is that we didn't rush with bishop uh, with f4. We played that one setup move, bishop e3. Our opponent stubbornly played queen f6, and after knight d5, the game is already over because queen d8 f4 is just a complete and total and utter disaster. G7 is falling. Maybe black can survive for longer, but but obviously c5, we keep the queen on the same diagonal, take on g7, and probably knight takes e3 was more resilient, but I just think we can take the rook and then start just eating up everything on the eighth rank, including black's queen. So that's that. Another simple game. Let's get another one in. Any questions? Again, knowledge of openings at this level gives you a massive boost. I, I Keep repeating it because it's true. Okay, here we go. So e4, c5, Sicilian. Will we face another Baudler attack? I mean, at this level, we still face a lot of flank openings. And yeah, of course, another Baudler attack. This time, a delayed Baudler attack waiting for us to play d6 doesn't change the nature of the position. Our reaction is largely the same. Knight f6. We start by developing. Okay, knight g5. Very typical type of setup from a player in our opponent's rating range. I don't mean this, you know, condescendingly. It's, it's just the truth. It's intimidating if you don't know how to deal with it. And this is a lot more intimidating if your e7 pawn is on e5, right? That's what the fried liver and a lot of these Italian openings are predicated on. And part of, you know, how a lack of experience manifests itself is players don't realize how pawn structures impact uh, the effectiveness of their ideas. But what are we able to do here? We're just able to play e6. And we've kept the pawn in its initial square, and we completely disarm any, any threats that these two pieces might be posing. And then we can proceed calmly with our development. So technically, do we have a threat in this position? Sort of. We're threatening to play h6, kick the knight away, and then win the pawn on e4. Now, you could make a case that we shouldn't even bother to win that pawn, and we should just proceed with our development. This is if white castles, for example. If white plays d3 or knight c3, um, it's a moot point. But just pay attention to the, the game-changing nature of this move, e6. And white is already at a loss. He doesn't know what to do. Castles. Okay, so castles has been played. So we could go pawn hunting with h6. Probably they will drop the knight back to f3. We will take on e4. And because our pawn shell is so, is so safe and so nicely constructed, there is absolutely nothing to fear from grabbing this pawn. Absolutely nothing to fear. Um, if you want to be totally safe, you would play a move like knight c6 or bishop e7, but I'm trying to play maximally principled chess. There's a pawn. It's free. Let's grab it. Yeah, Yasser Sarawan is uh, beaming somewhere. Now, it's possible knowing, you know, thinking at this level that knight takes f7 is going to ensue or some outlandish move like some bizarro chess like f4 because... Remember, players often too stubborn. They don't want to go back. They don't want to admit their error. So our opponent is definitely thinking about it. I can guarantee you. And f7 is on, on their radar. We'll see. They're thinking. Very tempting. It's calling Suckriller's name. It's right there. You know you want to do it. Knight f3. Okay. So after a long think, to our opponent's credit, they do go back to f3. We grab the pawn. And rook to e1. Okay, sensible response. The knight on e4 is hanging. We have two options right off the bat. Of course, we have the option of dropping the knight back to f6, or we have the option of advancing our pawn to d5, expanding our central control, and simultaneously protecting our knight. Both moves, to my eyes, are completely acceptable. I like d5. It's uh, more principled. Is it a tempo move? Not really, because we're technically not threatening to take the bishop, because the knight will hang. But yeah, of course, our opponent drops the bishop back. And now let's 
can complete our king side development. Now, maybe some of you are tempted by a move like c4. You shouldn't be. c4, just bishop takes c4. The priority here is to complete your development, not to try to win the game in two seconds. So let's develop our king side. Bishop e7, d3, and simply bringing our knight back to f6. The knight has done its job. We're up a pawn. And notice how healthy our pawn structure is. Now we can castle, we can play knight c6. The particular move order here doesn't matter that much, so I'm playing quickly. We're simply trying to complete our development. Bishop a4, okay. Actually, our opponent is playing very sensible moves. So bishop a4, is white threatening to take on c6, right? So this is, again, an important distinction to make. Is bishop take c6 really a threat? No, it's not a threat. Is it something that we want to allow? Eh, maybe not, because then our pawn structure does become a little bit weak. Maybe white has this 95 move. None of it is an issue in the slightest, but if we can avoid it, we should. And we have a perfect way to avoid it, which is bishop to d7. Knight c3. And now let's complete our development with castle's kingside. I could be playing this in a slightly more sophisticated manner, but everything that we've done is positionally healthy. Knight e5. Okay, well, we're up a pawn. I don't mind a few trades. Let's simplify. Sure thing. Okay. So... Let's trade. Let's take on a4, especially because we're dislocating the knight. The knight is now very misplaced on a4. And a lot of you watching this probably want to go b5, right? b5 is a very tempting move, but b5 is, in my opinion, quite inaccurate because it helps the knight get back to where it wants to go anyway. So the more sophisticated type of move is d4. But d4 I also don't like because what do I notice in this position? Well, I ask myself, what is white's next move? And I noticed that the knight is making contact with the c5 pawn. I've mentioned this many, many times. You have to notice pieces that are making contact with your pieces and pawns. The bishop is also making contact with the knight. The white actually has this hidden threat. If we play d4, bishop takes f6 becomes extremely hard to deal with. Because we don't want to take back with the bishop. We drop the pawn on c5. And through our misfortune, we won't be able to even take on b2 there. And taking with the pawn is completely out of the question. So if we want to play d4, we need to do this in a more kind of refined manner, by which I mean we need to get rid of the knight first or get rid of the bishop first, and only then can we consider d4. So we could play b6 first, but that's kind of like putting a Band-Aid over the problem. I would like a move that carries a little bit more pizzazz or at least poses a problem to our opponent. I mean, a lot of you, rook c8, b6, these are very slow moves. White can take that opportunity to improve their position. I like the move knight d7, right? And maybe it wasn't on some of your radars because it's a retreating move, but I never judge a move based on whether it's a retreating move or an advancing move. It doesn't matter. Now, of course, I briefly made sure that there's nothing, no shenanigans going on on g7, but this move also contains a trap because bishop c3 is a very easy move to make and our opponent makes it. And bishop c3 takes away the escape square from the knight. So we could start with d4 and then play b5, but do we even need to play d4? Well, if we want to be super fancy, we should play d4 first. If we want to be, you know, Magnus Carlsen level precise, we should play d4 first. And there is a reason that I'll reveal to you after the game. There is a reason. Uh, there is something that b5 allowed that probably our opponent would not have found, but nonetheless. Nevertheless. Okay. <clears throat> And bishop, uh, knight takes c5, okay. So now we get a very pleasant choice. Now, we're already kind of thinking about simplifying because I'm anticipating being up a piece. So you want to grab the piece which leads to maximum simplification. And if you just do a little bit of calculation here, don't be lazy, just do like three moves of calculation. It will lighten your technical load tremendously. So what are the candidate moves here? Well, we can take on c5 with either piece. But we can also take on c3. And you might say, oh, well, pawn takes c3, white plays knight takes knight. And if we play queen takes knight, then we give up a pawn. But pawn takes bishop, knight takes knight, pawn takes pawn. That hits the rook on a1. And that leads to just mass simplification. And it makes our task a lot easier. Yeah. So just a small little detail, pawn takes pawn, intermediate move. This is an intermezzo. Um, was there anything wrong with queen takes d7? Absolutely not. Bc, as some of you indicated, bishop f6 is completely winning, totally winning. Who cares about 
a single pawn, but just trying to show you what high level technique looks like. It's kind of like not being lazy and trying to choose the most clinical option to save you some time and some energy. Bishop takes f8, okay. Why did I take with the bishop? Because, okay, king takes f8 looks awkward, and I want to keep the queen uh, readily kind of accessible. I want to keep these squares readily accessible. Let's get our rook into the game. g7 is protected. We have nothing to worry about. And now I can sense that we're very, very close to winning the game. So I'm looking for tactics. I could try to win this game tactically, but I'm not going to. I think that's slight overkill. My instinct, by the way, is to play b5 and try to open up the c file and try to find some sort of a back rank mate. But if we play this positionally, you might might also notice that in playing c4, white has created a very big weakness, a very big hole on d4. We could use that hole uh, for our queen. If we're able to put our queen on d4, we will basically force a queen trade. So how do we set that up? Well, we play bishop c5, which is a move that you have to play very carefully because, yep, white now has a mate threat. But we intercept the mate threat with queen to d4. We intercept the mate threat with queen d4. So remember, it's just the nature of chess that a mate threat can be posed in any position. So even I'm very careful. Double, triple checking, no threats. All it takes is, you know, two pieces to, to threaten checkmate. Okay, now rook h3 is a pretty neglectful move. Here, everybody should notice that our rook is just begging to be brought to c1. So our move would have been b5. This is a very simple deflection, and rook c1 is mate. Okay, so another simple, clean, crisp game. Um, not too much to say. I mean, of course, knight g5 is a very poor move. The correct move here is d3, and we have faced uh, the proper bowler uh, previously. But knight g5, we're going to see this again uh, for the next couple hundred points. Castles, h6, knight f3, knight takes e4. So some of you might ask, well, how did I make the intuitive determination that it's safe to grab the pawn? Well, first of all, I double-checked that there are no forks. Because you have to remember, anytime you have like a knight on e4 and a king on e8, you have to make sure that there's no queen a4, queen e2. Just quickly look at the tempo moves. For example, in the delayed alipin, the most famous trap is bishop e2, knight takes e4, queen a4 check. So these queen a4 traps are very, very common. So having made sure of that, okay, basically it has to do with how great our pawn structure is. e6 is protected twice f7 is unassailable white doesn't really have anything going for them the development advantage is super minor so there isn't really even anything to debate here um white has no initiative at all rookie one d5 develop everything develop develop our opponent helps us simplify and here i think knight d7 was a very nice move just something for you to pay attention to some of you were advocating for a very slow move like b6 but b6 is too slow a good player would take the opportunity to move the knight back into civilization or make a, a slightly menacing move like queen f3 so i knew that i needed something basically with tempo um, this hits the bishop white doesn't want to give up the bishop um, the correct move was probably bishop g3 but now d4 is really unpleasant for white white has to make this super weakening move but look at that knight on b2 and now our knight has access to that juicy outpost on c3. Um, is bishop d6 bad? No, bishop d6 is a very solid move. I like this move as well. Yeah, bishop d6 is a perfectly fine move. It's not the most ambitious move in the position. I mean, white can take and play knight c3, but yeah, you're up a pawn. So nothing wrong with bishop d6 at all. But knight d7 is, I think, the clinical move. Now, finally, what was the reason I didn't play b5? And... Black is winning, don't get me wrong. This is not like a refutation, but it's still a move that you nonetheless would want to avoid if possible. What are we talking about here? What are we talking about here? Bishop takes g7 is correct. Very nice. Bishop takes g7 is correct, which is a desperado sacrifice in order to clear the retreating square for the knight, obviously. And now you have to deal with this long-term slight awkwardness of your king placement is this a big problem no the king can just hide on h7 but it's still good practice to avoid this type of counterplay if it is within your power okay obviously he would never see that but still just trying to build good habits also queen g4 right? why 
allow any counterplay against g7 when it can be avoided with d4, um, if that makes sense. And after this was played, dc, simple calculation, simplification, and then anytime a pawn moves, you have to get into that habit of immediately assessing what squares are now at your disposal. d4, backward square, a backward pawn, square in front of it is often weak, boom, boom, set up the win. All right, I think I have the energy for one last game, guys, and then I'm going to call it a night. Let's get into it. 962. And another Sicilian. And another Bowdler. Amazing. <laughs> so, of course, here we play knight c6, and we have, and again, we face queen f3. And for people watching on YouTube, a good opportunity to uh, test yourself. Do you remember how to m properly meet this move? We've already faced this. And, of course, the move is 95. You want to play like a GM, you go 95 and you stick it in your opponent's face. Yeah, this is this is just very pervasive at this level. And what's funny is that, OK, queen b3. So this guy, unlike our previous opponent, does not blunder the bishop. And as I indicated, then we grab the bishop pair. That's the whole point. And we have the bishop pair. In, in addition, the queen on c4 is an incredibly awkward, poorly placed piece. And in that analysis, of the previous speedrun game, which featured this line, I mentioned that the obvious move here is d6, but d6 allows this very strange check on b5, where if you block with the bishop, you have to give up the b7 pawn. And I really don't want to go into an endgame this early. So instead of d6, I'm actually going to go e6. I'm actually going to go e6. Now you might say, well, aren't you worried about this bishop being bad? Well, not at all, because remember in the Sicilian, it's very standard to fianchetto it on b7. Not an issue at all. There are many setups that we could choose here, many, many setups that we could choose. The one move that I would probably avoid is the immediate knight f6, because it allows white to establish this kind of clamp in the center with e5. Um, I'm going to make an advanced, advanced Sicilian move, which is a6. Now, this is a move and this is a setup that you're probably familiar with if you're a Sicilian player watching this. If you're not, a6 might come as a surprise and that's okay. All I'm doing is preparing b7 to b5. I'm preparing queenside expansion. And while I'm at it, the main purpose, of course, is to find accommodations for my bishop. So white plays the move e5 right away. And it's not as good for white to play e5 when our knight is still on g8. Because basically we could say, okay, I've received information about your setup. Now the knight can basically crawl around the pawn. It can weasel around the pawn. And it actually has a lot of really, really nice squares from which it can put pressure on that pawn. But there's no reason for us not to play b5. We can follow through. And the first step is going to be to get that bishop to b7. Queen f4. Okay, I don't see an issue. Knight g5 is probably going to happen, but is not dangerous. Not dangerous at all. Why is this not dangerous? Some of you actually might be a little scared here. There is at least two good moves in this position, at least two. The obvious move is knight h6. You just have to be familiar with this way of defending the f7 pawn or the c7 pawn, and that's what we're going to do. It develops a knight. And you might say, well, doesn't this develop a knight to a bad square? Well, remember, white played the move e5. So knight h6 is a move that I actually was going to contemplate anyways because it's a transit point for the knight to get to f5. So knight h6 is a great multi-purpose move. But this is kind of annoying to me. This, this entire construction is annoying to me. How do we deal with it? Well, bishop e7 is the obvious move. But let's pause for a second. Bishop e7, white is going to play d3. Bishop e7, white is going to play d3. And do we really want to trade everything on g5? No, that, that lets white off the hook. If you look at this from a developmental standpoint, white is lagging very seriously in development. White only has the queen developed and the knight. The entire queen side is frozen. So if you apply that mode of thinking, you might come to a different move, which is, well, what do you know about exploiting a big development advantage? What are you supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to open the center, right? You're supposed to open avenues of attack. And so from that perspective, what move starts to look a lot more attractive? d6. Not, not d5. But d5, white is not forced to take on Passan. d5 is what white wants. White wants to see d5. d6. Okay. And now we can proceed to open up the center. And that is going to spell really, really big trouble for white. But let me think about how to do it. Because we can actually start with knight f5. 
Or we can take and play knight f5. But there's a little knight sack I have to consider. None of it actually works. But I want to get the move order right here. Takes an issue. There's just so many, so many great options here that I'm flirting with. Okay. Let's go. Hmm. Let's take and go knight f5. And <clears throat> what was I calculating? I was making sure that white doesn't have knight takes e6 here. Just double checking, right? Because you never know. But again, there's no magic with one piece on the board. Knight takes e6, f takes e6, queen takes e6, check. It does look a little bit scary, but you just block with your knight on e7. I'll show you after the game just how not scary that is. It loses. Okay, queen e2. Our opponent is backpedaling, clearly showing that they're aware of the danger. We're not just going to let our opponent off the hook that easy, though. We have the initiative. Our opponent is backpedaling. We need to exploit this moment and try to get as many of these really nice tempo moves in as possible. So what do we start with? Well, we can start with knight d4. I think a lot of you are thinking about knight d4. Queen d5, I do not like. I do not like the move queen d5. I like the developmental approach. Always start, if you're not sure which move to start with, start with a move that you're not going to regret later. Bishop e7, great move. Develop a piece. Can't really go too wrong with it. White hasn't learned their lesson. Continues to play with only two pieces on the board. Well, our move is obvious here. I'm going to speed up a little bit. G6, hitting the queen. And white is now in very serious danger of losing this knight. Very serious danger of losing this knight. And we're going to continue. We're going to play h5, harassing the queen further. And I think white is able to save the knight, but by the narrowest of margins, and white's problems extend far deeper than just potentially losing a minor piece. White is potentially just dead lost here. Okay, queen f4. So let me see if I can come up with, a, with an accurate move. So what is, what, is, what is on tap here? What are the candidate moves? Well, we can play bishop to d6 and force the queen onto this incredibly awkward square on d2. And then we could try to set up some sort of an attack against white's king. That could be one option. If we wanted to play this more positionally, we could also play a move even like queen to d4. Mm, let me think about this. H4 is possible. I mean, the, really anything. E5. Actually, wait a second. Does E5 work? E5. Queen takes E5, F6. Queen E6, Bishop D5. Wow. That's actually really cool. Yes. Let's go E5. Let's play tactically. Let's play in the spirit of the Sicilian. Okay. What was I calculating? Well, obviously, I was calculating this move. And the response is obvious, f6. But that's not the end of the line. And this is advanced. So I feel like all the 1800s perked up when I started calculating this. Queen to e6 is the move, is the money move that I was calculating. Knight e6 is not a serious move because we obviously just take the queen. And white takes our queen. And we take white's knight and we're up a piece. So you're not really going to be tested at this level, but still it's good to ha have that calculated to make sure that it's correct. Okay, so I'm actually going to sacrifice the e-pawn. I'm going to go king f7. This is a move that people should pay attention to and not just gloss over because king f7 is going to win us the game really quickly. Now I'm going to go, well, we can go rook h8, we can go bishop d6, it doesn't really matter the order. Bishop f6, rook takes c5. You don't want to gratuitously give up pawns because you don't have an infinite supply of them. We're going to go bishop to d6. The rook is forced back. Now, rather than just automatically playing rook e8, remember you pause, always pause for a couple of seconds. Maybe a better move announces itself. The moment you pause, a better move announces itself. Knight d4. Knight d4 is just a killer. Now, why did I sacrifice that e-pawn? Because I anticipated that with white's queen side entirely dead, we are going to win the battle over the e-file. In fact, that's what we're going to be doing right now. We're going to win the battle over the e-file. There was no battle. White surrendered, and we're threatening mate. Just look at our peace coordination here. It was honestly a no-brainer to, to give away that pawn. Now we can start looking for mates. Um, now we can start looking for mates, but we can also start not looking for mates. We can also just win the game in like very uh, in a very plain vanilla way, whatever you prefer. Let me think. Yeah, there's just such a such a nice nice choice here. Bishop f4 is the is the obvious move. Although I can go rook d1 in that position. 
Um, we could play bishop takes h2. There's nothing wrong with that move. I'm just trying to set up some sort of a mating pattern. Okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna try to get a mate. I'm gonna try to get cute. I'm gonna try to get cute. Yeah, let's get cute. Let's go rook. Ah, let's go rook e6. I was gonna go rook e5 and try to sack something, but ah, we'll have time for that later in the speed run. Let's just go rook e6. Rook e8. Doubling rooks and threatening checkmate on e1. Knight e4, we just smashed through it. I mean, this is just like a tank that's blowing through, you know, medieval style constructions. And now, of course, we play knight takes e2. You can't forget about that pawn. Our opponent's going to go here, and then we're going to mate them on e1. Bingo. Perfect. Like a knife through butter. That was not an easy game. I have to say, there were a couple of moments where I genuinely had to pause to think because I'm trying to play objectively, even if, yes, I can really get away with anything at this level. It's true, but I don't want to do that. Okay, so interesting game, and I'm honestly kind of shocked that we are continuously facing, continuously facing this stuff. We still haven't faced like a single normal Sicilian or, or a Glex system. So sidelines still prevail at this level. Okay, so Queen F3, 95. Remember that in the other game, we faced Queen F4. Here, at least our opponent keeps the bishop, uh, keeps the material equality. So, okay, so E6, Knight F3, and A6. And like I said, if you're a Sicilian player, you should be familiar with the setup. It's called the con setup, and it's most commonly applied in the open Sicilian, in the con variation, where you play e6 and a6, and oftentimes you put a queen on c7, but then the move b7, b5 is essentially like the lingua franca of all Sicilians. Like the move b5 is a common move in any Sicilian variation, practically every Sicilian variation. Uh, so rather than just kind of anemically going b6, we have the time and the luxury to prepare a more expansive approach on the queen side. And look at how our pawns are just controlling so many important squares. Okay, so <clears throat> e5 by our opponent, very overzealous, b5, queen f4. Uh, in response to queen to e4, by the way, uh, we would have gone, we would have just gone rook b8 and then bishop to b7. So when e5 does not come with tempo, it's not as good of a move. So queen f4, bishop b7, knight g5, and knight h6. Very important, uh, very important concept, developing the knight to the side in order to uh, defend f7. The other move was f6, but I thought it was a little bit premature. And after castles, actually a critical moment. Um, you should really pay attention and make sure that you understand the logic behind d6. Because a lot of people, they would go bishop e7, White would play d3, they would castle, white would develop the knight, and black is better, but not that much better. I understood that there's a brief window of opportunity where white is so underdeveloped that if we can open up the center immediately, white runs the risk of just losing material. That's why I played d6. Um, <clears throat> so obviously if white takes, we play bishop takes d6, queen e3, knight f5, and the knight is simply going to be lost. Um, so kudos to our opponent for Finding d3, very cold-blooded move, trade, and knight f5. What was I thinking about here? Um, obviously, I want to play bishop d6, but we can't because of queen takes g7. So we want to play f6, but we can't because of queen takes e6 check. Um, if you're panicking here and you're in time pressure, you could play queen d5 and trade queens, but we don't want to do that. We're ahead of development, so that's why knight f5 um, was played. I was just double checking this move. And in this position, white is forking the king and the knight, but you have knight e7 or treating. How do I know that this is not scary? Again, white has no pieces in the attack. There's no attack. For example, let's say white plays rookie one. We play queen d5. The king is perfectly safe on e8. Yeah, it looks a little bit awkward, but it's everything is perfectly safe. Everything is defending each other. To keep the queens on the board, white has to retreat all the way back and we could even tuck our king away on f7. So you can't really play the Sicilian if you're not willing to take a little bit of you know, discomfort in some of these situations. OK, so bishop e7, developing with tempo. Queen h5 is essentially the fatal mistake. And then we get to the final critical moment of the game where I was just calculating the move e5. Now, again, if you're a newer player, none of this is necessary. You can, you can just castle. You can play bishop to d6. There's a million good moves here. but 
I really feel like e5 brings the hammer down. Um, because after queen takes e5, f6, it's a fork. But this move had to be considered, queen e6. Um, but everything works perfectly. Why is queen e6 a thing? Because fg, queen g6, and the knight is lost with check. So who can remind me of black's move in this position? Some of you might fall for knight d4, but that does allow this check on f7. It's not bishop c8 that allows the check on f7. It's bishop to d5. You need to kick the queen away, but also to prevent, while you're at it, the check on f7. Queen moves back, and you take the knight, and we're winning. Again, unnecessary. If um, you want to play it safe, you can play a move like bishop d6. Um, White should have played queen d2 and kept some hopes alive, but after something like knight to d4, I mean, White's position is very painful to even look at. And that's basically it. White gave up the piece. We took it. And then, of course, we give up the e-pawn strategically because I can sense that the best way to convert the development advantage is to open up a file for our rooks. Because White doesn't have the firepower to maintain the file in their control. And that's, uh, that's the rundown of the game, folks. Hope you uh, found this to be instructive. We're pretty rapidly rising through the ranks. Good night, everybody.